Hi, everyone. I'm Bryn Tillman. Thanks for coming. I usually have such a big mouth, I never need a microphone. So this is a whole new experience for me. So excited to have you here. You guys came here to learn seven tools for social selling or for productive online work. But they told me I had an hour. I'm like, seven tools. So we're going to do so much more. And the seven tools will be part of the, the presentation. So we're going to talk about eight stages to rolling out a social selling program. And tools is one of the eight. So when we get there, we'll break down the tools that you saw and all of the promotion that you've seen. But before we get started, let's go around the room quickly. Tell us your name, what brought you here today, and what you're hoping to get out of this. And we'll do it really fast. We'll do it. And you have to do it in the mic. OK. So let's start with this gentleman here, if you don't mind grabbing the mic. Hi, my name is Onoma Sanchez. I'm the business Ms. Morrison. And uh, myself and my family, we're real estate investors, and me and my family are here to learn more about uh, social selling. Okay, fantastic. Welcome. Hi, my name is Miata Clark. Um, I'm here also with my family. I am a realtor in Delaware and just getting started, so I wanted to come to see how I can better, you know, put my business out there. I see. A commercial or residential? Residential. Fantastic. Hi, my name is Angelo. Uh, with my family here, we are a family of real estate investors, and we're just trying to see if we can better help our family with the business. Excellent. I'm Natasha Clark. I, too, am a part of my family. Pretty much everything that they said as well. I am a real estate investor as well, and I'm here to learn about social selling to market ourselves much better. Fabulous. Hi, I'm Carrie Baskin uh, with uh, the marketing department. We help companies build their brand and target their ideal customers and generate leads. Um, I'm here today because I only recognized one of the seven products on the list. So I figured there was at least six things I could learn tonight. So thank okay, you. Okay, wonderful. Hi, my name is Kristen. I'm actually Lynn Williams' assistant. And uh, like you had said, I actually hadn't heard of some of the things on the list and just wanted to learn some new things. Cool. Oh, they have their own microphone. That's awesome. It works now. It works now. Okay. Uh, I'm Steve Bridgeco. This is uh, Ella Bridgeco, and we have a company. It's Clear English Speech, and we have software uh, that's designed and also private lessons to help people who have difficulty being understood. Speaking English. Hi, I'm Mike Chiodo. I'm a real estate investor, and I'm just here to learn something new. Try to speak right into the mic, please. Good evening. I'm Jeff Dordick. I'm currently in transition, but there's always something that you can learn. Um, I'm usually involved in manufacturing of architectural and building products. And what I'm finding out is the younger generation is moving away from traditional websites. So I'm interested in finding out a little bit more about social media. Hi, I'm Mike Galanti. I'm a marketing consultant for small and mid-sized businesses. Um, I'm here today to learn more about some of the items that were on the list that I didn't recognize. Okay, fantastic. Hi, my name is Lynn Williams, and I wear two hats. One hat is I write resumes and LinkedIn profiles, and I learn from the master, okay? Took it on the road my own way, though. Uh, the other hat I wear is I'm the executive director of the Philadelphia Area Great Careers Group, and uh, the Bucks County Marketing and WordPress Consortium. We market each other's stuff on our meetup platforms so that we can get more exposure. So a lot of you are here from the Philadelphia Area Great Careers Group. And uh, we run over 400 events a year. We have over 3,700 members. So uh, you don't know what you don't know. We got lots of things uh, for self-employed, employed, and unemployed. Hi, my name is Louise Beebe. I'm retired and just decided to start 
uh, a writing consulting business based on some helping some friends over the last year. And what I know what nothing, kind of writing? Uh, could be technical writing, protocols, clinical study reports, clinical research, or resumes, or um, I helped a young woman with her PhD dissertation. She got 100 on it after working with her for a year. And so it, I thought, hey, maybe I can get paid for this. <laughs> so anyway, thank you. On dissertations, talk to me afterwards. I have a great way for you to get to AVDs. So. My name is Rita Jetweiler. I have been filing Bryn for probably about five, six years, too many years. And I didn't even know what she was going to talk about. But when I saw her name, I knew I was coming. Thank you. I was thinking about cat videos, showing cat videos. <coughs> <laughs> uh, good evening. My name's Gary Miller. I do two things. I help people make money through real estate, and I help real estate investors two types, ones that are new, and those that are usually in trouble for something. <clears throat> I think there's a one right behind you if you want to take the... I'll use this okay. one for now. Hi, my name is Kent Roman. I'm a new business development, work with uh, small, medium to medium-sized large companies in terms of uh, closing the sales cycle. That's something that might be complex from a uh, six to 18 month sales cycle to shorten that cycle. Thank you. Um, I'm a sales business development uh, consultant for about the last eight years after a long career. Uh, launching products worldwide, uh, very tangible technology though, uh, unlike the things that a lot of things that we're dealing with now up in the cloud and everything. So I'm here to learn about some of the new techniques. Hi, good evening. Uh, my name is Jim Laverty. I'm currently in job transition. My background is in sales strategy and operations. Uh, I work with senior sales execs in a global sales organization to either start up a new sales team or get an existing sales team back to accelerated growth. Uh, secret sauce is in aligning the sales organization to client buyer behavior. And I'm here this evening to uh, learn about the productivity tools. Hi, my name is Dennis Becker and I'm with Parkside Graphics. We help businesses with their marketing um, online and uh, I'm here tonight because it, coming to meetings like this, you always learn something new. Everybody has a different outlook on what they're doing, and they have lots of different tips and ideas. So that's why I'm here. Get a stretch. <laughs> My name is Dennis Janaw, the other Dennis in the room. Uh, I uh, am the organizer of the Philly Apartment Meetup Organization, as well as the Philadelphia Apartment Network. And I syndicate uh, investors into commercial real estate deals and uh, always learning to, looking to learn new aspects of marketing. It's changed and it hasn't over the 30 some years since I was last in school learning about it and it continues to change. So I'm always here looking to learn something new. Hi everybody, my name is Craig DeVideo. That's my real last name. Um, I do television video for my living. I do sound and photography as well. Anything for, uh, uh, normal broadcast or cable commercials, training videos, online programming, things of that nature. Uh, thank you. Good evening, Susan Vorwerk, and I represent the tiniest Quaker meeting house in the entire world, I think. Um, but we, do I have to? <laughs> thank you. I'm not going to. Um, <laughs> tiniest Quaker meeting, uh, but we are looking to start an online presence. The meeting has not ever had one. Um, so just saw WordPress, which is where I started creating it, and thought, why not show up? So looking forward to it. Thank you. Uh, I saw Tom Gillis walk in. Tom, would you like to introduce yourself? Okay. Wait, wait for a microphone, please. Go ahead. It's on. It's on. It's on? Okay. Uh, my name is Tom Gillis, um, full-time real estate investor. Um, Don's meetings are always a winner, and uh, I saw this topic, and uh, yeah, I could use uh, some great new tools for 
saving time. Awesome. Looking forward. Thank you. Uh, Tom, did you, Tom Noble, did you introduce yourself? Oh, not yet. Okay. Would you like to? Sure. Only, it's not necessary. No, but. that's fine. Hi, my name's Tom Noble. I'm a co-founder of the Consortium with Don. Four years ago, and we have a permanent seat at Panera Bread. And, uh, <laughs> Uh, for my, I sat there. And for my own business, uh, I, I run uh, Pig Art Graphics, which is a website development firm myself, me, myself, and I, and I help small business with content development for the website. So even I make beautiful websites, it does not matter unless you've got good content on those websites. Thank you very much, Tom. Anybody else not introduce themselves? Cody? Would you like to? I'm going to grab the same one. Sure. <laughs> My name is Cody Offsetter. I do cybersecurity work for a living. Uh, I actually have a question I would like to ask the entire room. Don was kind enough to bring pizza tonight. I also own a restaurant slash catering business. So if in future meetings we would like them catered, I'm just going to do a show of hands real quick to see what the interest level is. We would essentially make personal pizzas, wraps, and salads possibly baked goods. Can I get a show of hands real quick? Who would be interested in that? You say food, I say yes. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. And yesterday, I know somebody in the room was talking about uh, millennials' mindsets, changes in technology, and Don and I actually did our first podcast for a new one called The Podcast of Life. It's no sponsorship, no product selling anything. It's just a conversation, topics related to life, and the first one was on the mindset of millennials. So when that's up, we'll post it if you'd be interested in that. That's it. Nice. The old and the new. Old and the young, actually. Yes. Uh, okay, so everybody introduced themselves. I guess I didn't. Uh, besides running the consortium, what I do in my other retired time is you notice a lot of real estate folks here. Uh, so I have relationships with lots of real estate folks since uh, I am what they call a private lender. So I lend money to the, many of the people here who uh, flip houses. So if anybody's interested in flipping a house and need funding, you can see me. So that's the end of my presentation. You're up. Ms. I'm up. All right. Well, I'm excited to share the eight stages to rolling out a social selling program. We all went through that. I'm Bryn Tillman. Hello. Why social selling? Well, number one, the buyer's journey has changed. 67% of, of buyer's research is done online before you even know they're in the marketplace. So if that's where they're gathering insights, where do your insights have to be? Online, right? You want to be part of that 67%. And it's really important that we've got that presence. Number two, we are digitally connected. Literally, the average person looks at their phone 85 times in a day. I think I upped that stat probably. So if that's where they're looking, where do you need to be? On their phone, right? And so social, with a little red circle on LinkedIn popping up, we want that to be us, right? It's where we want to be, that's what they're looking. And it literally is the evolution of sales. When I started in sales in 1990 for Dun & Bradstreet, we didn't even have a fax machine, let alone email or the web. So if someone needed to buy something, they had to call us so we could physically mail it to them. That gave us such an advantage because we knew when they were at the very beginning of their buying cycle. But if 67% of the work is done before we know that they're, that's a big shift. So we have to make sure that we are following this new buyer journey and that we are showing up where we need to. So the buyer's journey has changed. They are self educators, right? They're digitally connected and it's the evolution of sales. So why social, why social selling is paramount? 67% of the buying decision is made. Uh, this is one of my favorites. On average, and we talked about this earlier, there are 6.8 decision makers on every major sale. 6.8. Now, if you're selling into small business, when I started in sales, there was one decision maker, but they're collaborative today. 
They all have a piece of the buying pie. There's not one decision maker anymore. So we have to make sure that we're touching all of them. And social allows us to do this. It allows us to find the right people. It allows us to identify who we know that can get us to the right people. And ultimately, social allows us to touch all 6.8 pretty easily. So that when your buyer is in a room talking about your solution, they know who you are, they saw your stuff, they read your blog post, and you're familiar. Make sense? This is my number one favorite. 74% of buyers choose the sales rep that was first to add value and, and insights. So sales rep is anyone selling. If you're a business owner and you're selling, this is just a quote, so I can't change it. So, but think about this. 74% of the people will choose to work with the person that provided value and insights. It's not price. It's not rate. It's value and insights. That's the place that we have to come from. And we're going to talk about tools that will help you do that. But you have, we really want to start there. Right now, how many people are on LinkedIn? How many people are on LinkedIn more than three times a week? More than five times a week. Okay. So more than five times a day, right? Yeah, yeah right. More. <laughs> Most of us are on and we're doing random acts of social. We pop in, we look at our news feed, we read our notes, maybe we go to notifications, we look at the homepage and we're done. And there's no real process in place. So random acts of social get you random acts of business. So we're going to talk and we're going to talk about some tools that are going to help, but we're going to talk today about what it takes to run a social selling plan. Now, Social selling is not different than mo a lot of, we have some real high level sales leaders in this room right now. And what you're gonna see, you're gonna say, oh, that's old stuff. It, it's about taking traditional sales methodologies and adapting it to social. This isn't rocket science and it's not even that new. Most of us have done all of this in the analog world. And it's just about moving that mindset to digital. We've got some youngins here, so if you grew up on digital, it's not going to be too shocking to you. But for some of us that have that are seasoned and that started before the iPad was invented, <laughs> right? You know, it's about adopting. Here's the difference between social media and social selling. What is that? <laughs> <laughs> You like my little, it stopped now, but that little rock, it took me like an hour to get that little thing to move. Okay, so we'll do it again, watch. I thought it went back, there we go, ready? Look, oh, magic. So how do we get the phone to ring, right? The goal of social selling is to get more phone calls with targeted buyers. Social media is different. There's a lot of brand recognition, a lot of, a lot of share, we're gonna talk about sharing content and that kind of thing. But social selling is, a, is measured by phone calls when all is said and done. It's measured by how many of the right conversations am I having. So as we go through today, most everything is going to lead to more phone calls. How many of us want more phone calls with targeted buyers? So what, what are you looking for sales? You do sales for real estate? Residential or commercial? So from this perspective, B2B is a lot easier when it comes to LinkedIn. The commercial side, you guys are more residential, but you may find what, like, who are your buyers? Who are you looking? Um, people that are interested in distressed owners. Okay. So who, who else is working with them? I want to get to, there's a purpose of this. Who else is working with your motivated sellers? Who, their CPAs? Like, who knows that they're motivated sellers? Let's get them on the mic. Oh, on a mic. Can you use the, the mic? The mortgage mortgage broker. broker. So mortgage broker? Okay, that's a good one. Who else knows they're in distress? The bank. The bank. Okay. So that's going to be your buyer, right? And I know that's not your end user, but when we're talking today about social selling, we're dealing with the B2B side. So when I talk buyer, you think banker. Not your ultimate distressed home buyer, homeowner, 
you're thinking the more the mortgage broker or the banker is going to be your buyer. Anyone else residential or consumer driven? Everyone else is B2B? Okay, so then <laughs> you know what to do. Okay, wonderful. So there is a score, and, and I am all about KPIs, key performance, key performance indicators. If you do anything in sales, you need to measure your activity to make sure that what you're doing is productive. There is a basic social selling score. When I work with clients, we have 10 points of KPIs that we're checking every week. One of them is the most basic of all, but it's LinkedIn score, and it's your SSI score. And this covers your professional brand, finding the right people, engaging with insights, and building relationships. Those are the four areas that we train on. Ultimately, establishing your professional brand is your profile. We want to make sure that you are moving your profile from a resume to a resource. How many of you are providing phenomenal value on your profile right now? So and this is different than job seeking. So Lynn and I go back and forth with this all the time. She puts together the most perfect profile to go get a job. But when you get a job and it's in sales, we are going to tear it apart and rebuild it because they don't care about your president's club or your, your buyers don't. Like that's what the hiring manager cares about. And so you have to, if you want a job, you've got to build it Lynn's way. But once you have a job in sales, now we have to talk to our buyer. What does our buyer care about? What do they care about? What does your banker guy, buyer care about? I'm going to pick on you because you're right up front. What does the banker care about? Use the mic, please. Oh. We can't hear you otherwise. Thank you. Sorry about that. Uh, getting rid of the mortgage that's on the house. Okay. So where's the pressure coming from? Auditors? Where's the, we want to know what their pain is, right? What's the pressure coming from? Is it their board members? Let's go with bankers versus mortgage brokers. So there's the auditor pressure, right? Like if you've got bad loans, you've got slow loans. So our profile literally will talk about that. One of the biggest risks that bankers face are pr mortgage properties that are slow, you know, and turning them over ha has a huge impact on X. So if we move from I help mortgage bankers, I buy bad mortgages or bad mortgages, we want to talk about the pain first. This is killing you to have this on your books, right? And here are some insights. Is that me? <gasps> I'm so embarrassed. Hold on. Am I gonna, I'm going to pull. Here. Here. Usually it's silent. It's a sales call, too. It's not even family. That's sorry. That won't happen again. I apologize. So. The, the point is, your brand is now about helping them, not about you. That's where I'm getting on this. So think about that. Anyone else? What do you, who wants to play? This is important. Who wants to play with this? Okay. So, websites. Who are you selling to? People with bad websites or no websites? Get a microphone, Tom. <laughs> You know better. Every, everybody has a bad website now. Okay. Right. And they're all insecure. You get there and you get this big thing that says you're not secure. Do you still want to come here? That's scary. I don't want to go to their website because I'm going to, I, I don't, you know, yeah. Okay. So what's the challenge? I think I just gave, what's the challenge people with bad websites are facing right now? They got have to look professional now. Now they have to build trust through their website. The challenge is they have to make somebody feel secure when they come to their website, that they are the right place. Okay, so the challenge is they are not making people feel secure and trust their site. That's, that's what they're facing. Give me an insight that you could tell them, not a pitch, but an insight that if you were up here teaching them, what's an insight that you could give them to fix that, the first one? First one is to make sure that you can you have your name, address, phone number is constant and uniform across that site and across social media channels. 
Okay, channels. so that's a great insight that I bet you to everyone in here, they're gonna go back and they're gonna look at to see if that's the case. So and we're not gonna go through this now, but if you give them two or three insights. Now, who has a website? A terrible website. Now, who has a website? Okay, so you have a website and you visit his profile and it gives you some of these nuggets. Are you much more interested in having a conversation with him than if he talked about why you should buy from him? Yes. Because he's provided value. And you believe if he's provided value from the LinkedIn profile, imagine what would happen if you got on a call with him. So that's the mentality, thank you so much. Okay. That is the mentality that we want to take in establishing your professional brand. You want to put yourself out there as the thought leader, the subject matter expert, and the person that your buyer wants to have a conversation with because they're gonna learn from you. Remember that statistic from Corporate Vision? 74% of buyers choose the rep, we'll call it, choose the vendor that provided the most insights. That means three out of four people that you talk to that end up buying a solution will decide based on who provided the most insights. Who wants to be the one that provides the most insights? Social selling starts you there. The next one is find the right people. We're gonna go deep into this a little bit in a little while. Engage with insights, which is the sharing of content. I know I said that up here in establish your profile, but the engage with insights is taking that mentality, that thought process with content and build relationships I look at as prospecting. So there are eight stages we're gonna go deep into these, so I'm gonna go fast on this slide. I just love that I can animate things. It makes me so happy. We start with, we're gonna go deep into each one. Establishing goals and KPIs, we're gonna talk about that. Map the buyers. This is where we're gonna talk about our tools. Select tool stack. Develop content strategy. There's some tools in here too. Build a custom playbook and write value-centric profiles. And I knew there was eight. Where did eight go? Train, and, which you're getting sort of ahead of the game here, and measure and coach. But we're gonna spend time in the first six, really. So first, establish goals. How many of you ever went through, I, I think it was Franklin Covey, which is begin with the end in mind, right? So why is this so important? Why do we have to define what success looks like? What, uh, it's a question, yes, why, oh, a microphone. Go ahead, go ahead. Yeah, hello? Yeah. Because it provides you with a vision. So it's a vision, it's a destination, and there is no way we can put a plan together. Like, could you imagine, you get in your car, you packed all your bags, you got a week vacation, and you got no map. You got, you don't know where you're going, you don't have reservations. Right? Now, how many of you would say, all right, so I plan Disney World, we're staying at this hotel, I've got the park hopper tip, I've got reservations, I've got all that stuff done. That, that's, you know what you want, You've, that's the end in mind. I got park hopper tickets so that I can have dinner in Epcot, and then I can go to MGM for fireworks. Like, you've got that planned. If you don't and you show up at Disney World, you're like, oh my God, it's overwhelming. I don't know, has anyone ever done that? I've done both, planning is better, right? So if we do, what does that look like when it comes to sales? What does success look like? So who wants to play with this? No one wants to play, what does success look like? Okay, good. What do you, to remind, oh, you are the video guy, right? Oh, oh, microphone. Is that right? Did I remember right? That's, that's good. Okay, so what does success look like for 2019 for you? How many new clients? You don't have to share dollar amounts, but how many new clients? Uh, if I could generate five new uh, important clients uh, for the purpose of this year, that would be good for me. Okay. Can you, and you don't have to share it with us, but can you imagine what your services and products are for each of those five clients? Can you visualize that? I, you, want, you want me to verbalize it or you just want me to? Yes, I can. I, I can. Okay. So I want all of you to do this. This is your first piece of like, go home and do something. 
I want you to take out either a vision board. I do this on my bathroom mirror. I have a big mirror in my bathroom, and I have post-it notes. And I want you to put post-it notes at what success looks like. So for you, maybe it's we find 15 homes to flip this year, right? And then I want you to go, what does that look like? Here are homes in Germantown. I want three in Germantown. I want four in Horsham. I want whatever it is, right? And visualize that. Your word vision, right? That's your vision. And start with that. That's your number one KPI, my key performance indicator. Do I meet that goal? You want to articulate your activity with results and act, you articulate your goals with activity and results goals. Results goals is 15 houses. Activity goal, and we have to back it all the way up and we're not going to do that today, might be I have to call 25 mortgage bankers every week. That would be the activity goal. And if break it out and 25% is Horsham, then I'm not good at math. Let's say 20 because I can do that better. So 25% 20, 20, of those homes are in Horsham. We know we need to make four, five. See, my husband does the books. Five, I'm not good at math. We need five calls for Horsham because that's how I bring it back to my goal. Does that make sense? That got a little messed up, but you want to identify the organization department and rep goals. So this is if you were a company, everyone has different goals and you want to break them up. Most of us are independent, so we don't need to break those. Buyer mapping. We have to identify all your stakeholders. So we just identified two, commercial banker and a mortgage broker, right? So not in a bank. Do you know other people? We can do other people. Who wants to go through who your buyers are? Who are your buyers? Let's do sellers instead of buyers, because I do more sellers. So, okay, sh share again what okay. you do. I do real estate, okay, but I do more sellers than I do buy. Than so I your do buyers. buyers are or home smaller, yeah, or home, yes, that's correct. Okay. Or, or property properties that they want to get rid of. So let's just call them stakeholders. They're Fine. the people. Stakeholders. Okay, stakeholders. Fine. So that's great. So, um, and those typically are residential consumer, right? We'll stay with residential for yes for this okay. discussion. So who are the B two B people that they work with that you could get in front of? Is it the same bankers, mortgage people? Are you looking for distressed properties? I'll take distressed properties, yes, okay. But do I, I'll take whatever whatever kind of, re, I get this in my business, the referrals. So it's my database that sends my business to me. So who is a good referral partner for you? CPAs, who could refer business to you? Nursing homes. I mean, think like there, can you think of any, Don? This is your world too. Rita is one of the world's best real estate networkers, so she can answer this question very well. Well, I, I get, see, I, I'm not normal, so I get most of my stuff from my database, and I almost need to have it referred to me mm -hmm. because I have the ability of knocking off to my team the people who are not referred to me. Okay, so who, who's referring business to you? My database, people who I have done transactions with in the past. Okay. Have you ever gotten referrals from B2B from anyone in business? Yes, absolutely, sure. Who, who are those? Oh, I get from accountants, mm -hmm. a, a lot of business from attorneys. Estate attorneys or? All kinds of attorneys, divorce attorneys. Ah, okay. so okay, so now we're, t this is where I wanted to land, right? That's exactly it. Where are the people that can refer the business? And on LinkedIn, this is who we're talking about. So when we identify stakeholders, it's the divorce attorneys, because we want to mm -hmm. connect with them. Mm -hmm. We want to add them to our database. Probate. Fabulous. That's exactly what I was driving down to. So do you see how we found more buyers from a LinkedIn perspective? The more we could drive. So stakeholders, mm -hmm. they are, you know, we said their buyers are bankers. It's really who is the person that's going to either refer the refer the business to you. So that's great. Thank you for that. But do you see how we drilled down to get to those right people? So just a clarification, Bryn, uh, 
there's two sides to a real estate transaction in, in uh, Rita's case. The first is to get the listing, mm -hmm. which is what she was just talking about. The second is to sell the house to a retail buyer, which is the least profitable of the two options. So if Rita could just spend all of her time getting listings, she would be a very happy lady. Did I get that right? I would be most happy if I was getting apartment listings. Oh, isn't that interesting? Well, now you're B2B, so now you want to go find the realtors that are, because that's that's more, you're, that's interesting, the property owners. We should talk, we'll talk, okay. So record the titles and keywords that describe them, define, addition, define additional filters, location-based, industry-based. Develop a Boolean string, we're gonna show you how to do that, and pinpoint the business challenge for each stakeholder. So we started talking about this earlier. Each of your stakeholders has a different pain point. The CPA and the attorney is very different than the mortgage broker. So you wanna make sure that you're, you're, you're pinpointing the business challenge for each of them, that you know what is the solution I provide for their role. And if you can get that, we're gonna articulate that later on, it's a big deal. So we're gonna develop a search string. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on this because I'm taking up a lot of time before we get to the tools which you guys are interested in, but we do wanna develop a search string. If you reach out to me, I will PDF this and get you some of this, but this is how we des develop a search. Does anyone know what a Boolean search is or a search string? Okay, so LinkedIn is funny. As, as new as it is, it's old when it comes to searching. <laughs> And Boolean search is pretty old when it comes to, to searching. And we use modifiers like or, ands, and nots. So in this case, it's marketing or sales. That's gonna give us a list of people that have either title. It's a gigantic bucket of people. Bryn, can I ask a question? Yeah. Yes, you're right. Boolean searches are very old. Uh, Google, of course, uses natural language searching. Mm -hmm. uh, since you are so connected to LinkedIn, to your knowledge, is LinkedIn planning to do a natural language search engine? There's, from everything I understand, and believe me, I ask, there is no methodology around that right now. And it's interesting because Microsoft purchased them. And I would think Microsoft, so the only natural search that's being worked on is this combination of Microsoft and LinkedIn ProFinder. I don't know if anyone's familiar with LinkedIn ProFinder, but it's how to find consultants. We won't get into it. But, and LinkedIn Learning. So it used to be lynda.com. It's like, so if you are looking for help in Microsoft, in natural language, it will shoot you to buy a video from LinkedIn Learning, or it'll give you suggestions for consultants that you can buy from to house. So the next step after <laughs> natural language search is AI search. None of that. Which is a big, it's just happening with Facebook and Google and and so on. And you're saying that LinkedIn, that LinkedIn is not. given the size of the company, is not? That is not, from everything I know, that is not their that? focus. That's now, AI search is so interesting. I'm going to tell you something that happened that freaked me out a little bit. One of my best friends is a nursery school teacher at Abington Friends. And she said, what was your kid's favorite book or books? So I put Magic Treehouse. My kids love the Magic Treehouse books. No joke, I went to Amazon and it recommended Magic Treehouse books. How creepy is that? That's AI. Yes, and it's embedded in all things Amazon, That's all crazy. things Google. And I'm really surprised as hell that uh, LinkedIn is not adopting that because Facebook has, mm -hmm. or is, I should say. And uh, okay, well, let's move yeah. on. Okay, so and is a smaller search. Marketing and sales means they have to have both terms to come up. Not is marketing, not sales. So if they have marketing and the word sales in their title, they will not come up in this list. They have to only have marketing. Personally, I use this when it comes to like human resources, not talent if I'm looking for benefits, right? Like that's how I might take some people out of a list. If we have more than one title, Vice President Marketing, you've got to put quotation marks around it or you'll get Miami Vice, right? So you wanna make sure you're doing that. And, and, and I'll send these out. So if you need this, I know I'm going quickly through this. And there's parentheses 
Just like in mathematical equations, you remember like in fifth grade, do everything in the parentheses first. So this is a bucket of vice president or director. This is a bucket of marketing or sales, huge bucket in each. But the and means you have to have one from this bucket and one from this bucket to come up. So anyone in marketing and sales, they have to be vice president or director to show up in your search. This is how we buy your map on LinkedIn along with lots of other filters. So this is my typical search, vice president or director and marketing or sales. That's my buyer mapping. I have other filters like Greater Philadelphia Area, and I use Sales Navigator, which is a paid, uh, a paid version that allows me other filters like size of companies. So I'll look for certain companies of certain sizes. I know I went through this quickly. It's important to do, to do my buyer mapping. I'm happy to give anyone 15 minutes to help you design this. Just You can write 15withbrin.com. Maybe a couple weeks out, I'm scheduled tight, but I will help you do this because this will change your business once you can do this. Tool stack, which is what you thought you were coming for. There are productivity tools, platform of record. Does anyone have a CRM? So I'm a huge fan of CRM. It's, it's uh, uh, customer, oh my God, CRM. Relationship management tool. It's late. So I use something called SharpSpring, which integrates everything, my website, my email, all that stuff. It's actually very WordPress friendly. Um, so that's what I use as my platform of record. You need to have one place where all your, so that if you talk with someone a year ago and they call you and you're like, oh, what did we talk about? Like if I took notes from our conversation, this would, right? So you need a, a, a it's really important. And calendar syncing tools, we're going to talk about that, is life-changing. And then LinkedIn versus premium, we'll talk a little bit about that. So there are seven tools that we were going to talk about today. We're going to go through these in different sections, but the first one is Feedly or Feedly.com. This is a content curation platform. This is a freemium tool, meaning you get so much for free and then they tell you to pay. I've been using this for five years. I have not had to pay yet. You just have to put up with their promotional stuff that comes up. I'm happy to do it, and it's free. We're gonna talk, we'll talk more about that. Buffer schedules your content. So I, on Sunday, well, I only have one more week to do this, but during football games, I go and I'd schedule all of my content for the whole week. So I could be sharing right now while I'm working. And that's what Buffer will do. Hootsuite will do the same thing. I moved from Hootsuite to Buffer, but Calendly, how many of you have a calendar app where people can schedule with you? Life-changing, right, did you think? Life-changing. If you take nothing else away from today, you're gonna go get Calendly.com. Yes. So I pay, but most of my clients have the free version. I think so, it's $19 a month. Well, then you're paying so that they can, you can charge them too. Like there's, I pay $10 a month. You have the ultimate package. $19 a month, okay. Yeah. I can so, handle that. Yeah, and I pay 10 and I can handle it, yeah. So there's three levels, there's free, there's the 10 and there's the 19. Um, you get you have your own like after they buy they can go to a landing page and all that fun stuff That's I don't know that but okay. I'll, check I'll help you leverage the $19. Okay. That'll be great. So What you get is it will see how many of you have a Google or office 365 calendar? All of you so this syncs and It reads your calendar and it knows when you're busy and it knows when you're open and you can also tell it I only want calls from nine to three o'clock on Monday, and from four to six o'clock on Tuesday, and so on and so forth. And then look at your calendar and says, what's your first name? Just Oprah. Oh, okay. So there's Oprah and Onismus. Onismus? Yes. It's actually kind of cool, but I'm gonna call you O anyway, because. So, so the it's gonna look and see the calendar and say, oh, look, you have three time slots open. I now can pick it, I can book it. It sends us both a calendar invite. Within six seconds, it's on our calendars. 
and it's off of the site so nobody else can book it. It's amazing. Yes, what? Oh. She's good, she remembered. What made you choose Calendly over some of the other apps? So there were like other what was apps. The benefit? With, there like are other apps that I or something else. It's the easiest, the cleanest, the most adaptable. There are so I, I had a few. I had time trade and I had schedule once, um, and they were a little clunky. And there were things I didn't like, like time trade. When I had it, I think it has it now. Didn't have buffer times. And that made me crazy, so I put 15 minute buffers in my calendar so they don't book back to back and time trade was booking me back to back. They may, it's been eight or 10 years since I had them, but so this did everything I needed. It's missing nothing. So does Calendly integrate with a website such that you can put something on your website that you say push here to beautiful. schedule? Beautiful, beautiful. So mine is integrated in my WordPress site. Okay. So. In your, like when you're in your Calendly, there's a little button that you do drop down and it says embed code. You pull the embed code in and you pop it in your WordPress and it's fabulous. Yeah. Not, and then any change you make inside of Calendly, it's the exact, it's totally synced almost in real time. It basically brings in your, uh, your uh, Google Calendar. Do you want to go, if you want to go to um, 15withbrin.com on a, or on, and they can see it? Yeah. You have to do it though. Yeah. Is that what you want to do now? Yeah. 15, so 15withbrin.com. 15withbrin. Yep. Okay. Stand and you'll by. see it on my WordPress site. So, and so you can see how it embeds. So here's the thing. How many times have you had someone that might be interested and you have an email that goes back and forth How's Tuesday at 10, can't do it, how's Thursday at three? And then by the time you're on the third email, they lost momentum. So this is, this is, I'm Is it the word 15 or one the number? Five, one five, I know, I'm, so one five with Bryn, B-R-Y-N-N-E, dot com. I bought that on GoDaddy, by the way. I own like 70 URLs because I would never remember what it is on my website. So I just redirect everything. So here's my WordPress site. If you scroll down, here's my 15 minute call and here's my 90 minute call. Now I'm pretty booked, but if you scroll a little bit down, this is what it looks like that you have to, gonna, you're gonna have to go all the way down here, scroll here. Yeah, and then go to the next week. I, it's unfortunate, I'm, or I'm not sure if it's good or bad. Okay, there's my first time, February 7th. If you click on that, this is for a 90 minute session. Here are all my available times. And if you click on that, you're able to schedule it and it automatically will go. So this is how, when, okay, you don't have to do that now because then I won't be available again for a long time. But my 15 minutes, there's more of. So there's the 15 minute and the 90 minute. So people can schedule time with me. And I have about, I'll tell you, I have about three to five prospecting calls a day that I've generated using social selling. And that's why I'm so booked up now. So, oh, sorry. <laughs> right. Go so ahead. on the free version, uh, which I just set up, I was inspired for coming here. Um, I, it, it automatically goes in my calendar and books a time. Does the paid version have the opportunity where it suggests the time to the person and, and you have the ability to override it or not, or does it just go in? So it'll come into your, you can't override it, but it does come mm -hmm. into your email. So you could reach out to them and say, oh, I'm sorry, we just I just double booked this time. Um, and then there's a reschedule link that okay. you get, and you, I just send them that at the top, I copy the reschedule link, um, but, uh, the, the paid will give you other things that are, are pretty cool. Yeah, so actually you can't override it because uh, it, uh, it, uh, it posts the calendar event on your Google Calendar. If, yep. If you're using Google Calendar, then just go into Google Calendar and make the change. Oh, absolutely you could do that. I thought you meant override the calendar, the, like through the no, through no. calendar. No, so if you book. Right, right, uh, you just, if you talk to them on the phone. If you book Thursday at 2 o'clock and, and I want, I'm not available at 2 o'clock or I don't want to. I want to change it to 2.30. You can suggest. 
just change it to 230 on the calendar. Oh, that's, that's true. All. But and and then it'll so it won't when it somebody here. sends a regular Google Calendar invite, it comes in my inbox as white. And when I click yes, then it turns blue. Okay? okay. But this one, it just automatically goes in without we'll me blue. blessing it and it turns blue. Well, because Calendly assumes because that's available on your calendar, that is right. your blessing. All right. Yeah. So, Got it. Yeah. Yeah. So. Yeah. Yeah, so, so Calendly, if you have any more questions on that, let me know. Everyone needs to have that. Um, even if you're in transition, what a great way to get your, your hiring managers to schedule a time to talk with you. Snipply is one of my absolute favorite things. How many of you are content sharers or producers? Can I go back to Calendly for oh, just sure. a second? Oh, sure. So very often somebody will say, you know, I want to talk to you sometime. Well, I don't want to call them up and play telephone tag. Are you available on Thursday? No, I'm available right. on Tuesday. You just send them the link to your calendar and say to them, click on this, pick a date and time that works for you because it'll only show them what dates and times are available, are available to right. you, which will be which ones that they are interested in. So it saves a huge amount of time to do that. I 100% agree with that. It's absolutely phenomenal. Excuse me, does this work in-house too because mm -hmm. It does, you know what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. um, because we're responsible, well, my sister and I, and one other member who isn't here, um, we're responsible for uh, scheduling contractors and things like mm -hmm. that, but then we also have family members that needs to be scheduled meetings and reminders. 100%, and, and you can also schedule not just one-on-one, -on -one. you can create a link if you're paying, like the $10, where you can have more than one person sign up for a time slot. So if you're having a group meeting and you're, you know, what you could have more than one person say. So yes, absolutely, and we use it internally all the time. And and it, a lot of it is like if I have my one of my salespeople's look, at, they're looking to schedule with me, like three people. So she's on the call with a buyer, and they want to get on my calendar. She hops on that on the call, and she can see my availability and look at her availability at the same time, and then be able to schedule that way. It's actually pretty cool. Is that good? Anything else on Calendly? Okay, so my next question is how many people share content a few, at least a few times a week? Okay, so this is a little, this is a sophisticated tool that's easy to use. Snipply is magic. If you share a piece of content and you click your little Snipply, and I don't, I think you can share 20 a week for free. Nobody's sharing more than 20 pieces of content a week. You can, so with this, you can actually click the Snipply link and choose some kind of call to action. So I run webinars all the time. So if I share a piece of content from HubSpot, when that gets shared and I put it in Buffer and on Tuesday at 10 a.m. it gets shared, at the bottom of the screen there's my face and it says register for a webinar and there's a hyperlink that takes you but it's on the HubSpot page, not my own content. So this is based on any content you share, your call to action appears. So if you wanted to share, what's, what's your real estate um, company that, that you work for? I work with Equity Realtors. Equi so does Equity Realtors have a ton of houses that are listed? Of course. Okay. So let's say you're sharing other people's listings. You're like, well, why would I do that? Because they get to the listing and you have a link to your Calendly. So you have this big, beautiful house that may not be your listing. It's your company's listing. So if they want to see it or buy it, great. But if you say, if you have a house that you, you, know, you like to get an estimate on, schedule 15 minutes with me. And that comes up on every single thing you share. And they click on that and it goes to your calendar to schedule your 15 minutes. I do it for webinars all the time. Imagine if you are sharing all this other, other people's content, but you have the call to action. And I can't tell you how much business, and I've had people say to me, that's amazing that you're doing a, a webinar with HubSpot, because <laughs> that's what they thought happened. Right? They registered, or 
Um, it could be if you're flipping a house and you put out, or you're putting videos out of other people flipping houses, but at the bottom of that share is, you know, do you have a distressed home that you're looking to get cash for? Schedule 15 minutes with me. You share goes back to your call to action. Yes. So if I see something cool that I wanted to share, like a lot of times, like right now, what's big in websites is Gutenberg. So the Gutenberg content. Is he still alive? Wasn't he? Didn't he invent the? He came back. Printer pr the printing press. They they exhumed Gutenberg, and he came back and he created content blocks. But I anyway, knew that. So if I wanted to share something that I found, I saw, and I wanted to shoot it to somebody that this is something cool to check out, then you how can. Does that... Yep. So what you do is you go into you go into Snipply. Mm -hmm. And you paste the link, and it gives you, sorry, it gives you another link, like if you bit lead it, mm -hmm. but it's snip lead it, yeah. and you share that link. Cool. All right. Yeah. Okay. So this is just out of ignorance on my part. If when we talk about doing sharing, you're talking about sharing on any platform, and right? Any platform, email even. So if I were to just follow through with a simple thought of using uh, Facebook more than anything else, if I were to Facebook and do a, uh, I found out that Panasonic came out with a new camera, right, for what it is, and it's, it's available at Best Buy, right, and it's a $399 camera that families could buy, and I put, and I get that ad, and I hyper, and I send that out, and I said, by the way, here's something new for you regarding the regarding my industry. And then people look at that at the bottom. It could say, schedule a conversation about this camera with Craig. Right? Yes. Wow, it's cool. It's really cool. And you get twenty um, twenty a week for free. So you create creating. I said that it could be a month. I pay. So this one I pay for because I do a lot, but I do other people's too. So I pay because I'm almost agency-like, because I have lots of calls to action. So you can have one, for the free, you can have one active call to action. You can stop that and do another one. Um, but it's, I mean, I can't even tell you the magic that this has brought me. It's amazing. Questions on that? How many people like that? Right? Next is Auto Text Expander, and you have this for both Chrome and for your iPhone. Now, I accept most of my LinkedIn connection requests on my phone. I want to send a welcome message. Do you guys send welcome messages? So, a welcome message might be, um, let's, Lynn, I'll use you for a second, right? Thanks very much for connecting with me on LinkedIn. I'm not sure if you are in a job if you're in job transition or if you're thinking about switching careers, but if you are, here's a valuable blog post that can help you do X. Right? So she's qualifying them. She's not saying I'm assuming you are, but if you are, you're a prospect for her. So should she pitch you? No, but if you're in job transition, I wanted to share this blog post with you that can help you update your LinkedIn profile to be found by more um, hiring managers. So now I'm providing value. But if I, I have that and I'm connecting with 15 people a week, 20 people a week, and I'm doing that on my phone, what a pain in the neck, right? And you gotta remember it all. Well, did you ever type on your phone and have a message, I'm in a meeting, I'll call you later, just pop out? You can control that. You can use those short codes on your phone. So write it one time with the link to the blog post or whatever that might be. Go into your settings. I know where it is on the iPhone offhand. I may have the directions in here, but I have directions for Android. And you go in and you paste your template and you give it a short code. So mine is W1. So if I type W1 anywhere on my phone, it says, thank you for connecting with me on LinkedIn. I'm not sure if da 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 And so if I just put in their name, comma, W1, I'm done. So I then welcome message every single time. You can go to actually autotextlink.com. 
And it's, for, it's a Chrome extension that does this. This is the best thing that has ever happened to me in the world of tools. Well, Calendly was too. They're like twins. I don't know which one I like better. I have twins. So. Right? So, but Autotext Expander, it saves you so much time. So I've got lots of templates. I've got networking templates. If I'm going to network with someone, what it says. So those, that's a good one. Boomerang for Gmail. Yeah. Does Autotext Expander work for Instagram? In Chrome. If you're in Instagram in Chrome, yes, it will. Okay. If you're in Instagram on your phone, yes, it will. Great. Yes. You, if, you, if you're on your computer but you're using Safari and you have it, it won't work. You have to be in Chrome on the computer for it to work. It's a Chrome extension. Um, so, and you have, uh, yeah. And then on your phone, it'll work anywhere. So Boomerang, for anyone have Gmail? So I'm sure that there's some kind of task in Outlook. But Boomerang for Gmail, if I have, a G, if I have an email and I respond to someone, I can go into my CRM and set a task, which I should do. I don't exactly do that because I use Boomerang at first. I can set a date or time for that email to come back to the top of my email. It's really cool, so, right? So again, there's so many you get for free in a month, and then every month it refreshes. It's a low dollar amount investment if you want to pay for it. But it's amazing for me. So if I respond to someone, so if someone says to me, how much is your one-on-one -on -one session? And I say, it's $500, and this is what you get, and this is what we'll do. And then I put it in Boomerang. And if they don't respond in three days, it comes to the top of my email, so I will follow up. For, isn't that awesome? Bryn? Yes. I hope you don't take this as a personal question, but because you're holding the microphone so close to your body, it's uh, making a bit of a sound. So don't, don't do this. Okay. Thank you. And the last I was going to use a different word, but your body sounded better. So I'll start with these. Uh, find that email. This is a LinkedIn. This is a tool I use with LinkedIn. It's Chrome. You get 50 a month for free. And if you are on a LinkedIn profile that you're not connected to someone, you go to find that email. If they work for a public company or a company where the email syntax is in their system, it will deliver the email and say 85% chance this is their email. 95% chance this is their email. So for me, there are some times where I look at someone and they don't have a picture, they don't, and I know they're not active on LinkedIn, but I want to reach out to them. Find that email as a Chrome extension. When you're on their LinkedIn profile, you just click the little icon. It takes about 20 seconds, and it will tell you what they think their, the email is. And it's about, I would say, eight out of 10 times it's right. Now, if they're not, if they don't have, if they don't have a real company listed, you will, it won't return. Uh, it, it doesn't matter about either one, but it's it's only for public companies that it's useful. No, so so find uh, find that dot email has it's any company that has website where there's emails on it. They'll they'll scrape off of websites. And then they'll match company names to company names on, on LinkedIn. And that's why it's like 85%. Because they may say, it's Bryn.Tillman at socialsaleslink.com. And they're now going to assume that every syntax is going to be first name dot last name at company.com. And, you know, and it'll check. It's checking. So that's why it doesn't break LinkedIn's, because it's not scraping anything. All it's doing is looking at the public company and looking at the website, and they're scraping data off of the website, which doesn't break LinkedIn's agreement. <laughs> For those of you who are interested in learning how to build email lists, uh, the consortium did two workshops last year uh, providing information on tools that pull emails out of LinkedIn, Facebook, and something, oh, the web in general. And all those videos are available on, on our website, which is buckscountymarketing.org. 
upper right hand corner button that says video. So uh, if you're interested or, or send me a note and I'll be glad to send you the links. So there's lots of ways of building email lists. Oh, by the way. Yeah, that's not my, my world. Okay, next there's content strategy. So when you're building a content, how many of you originate content? Okay, so I, every single person in this room should start to consider original content. The first thing we wanna do is identify what content does our stakeholder care about. Do each of you know what they would care about? Do you know what your stakeholder would care? Who are you selling to? Oh, you work with Lynn, yeah? It's not applicable. Not applicable to you. Anyone, tell me what your buyer cares about. Compliance. Okay, because your security. Okay, well, what else do they care about? Cost. Mm. Cost to actually do the test. Compliance, specifically for what it is. No, okay. <laughs> so they don't really care about cost yet. They might care about cost when you're getting to proposal time, but not when you're drawing in their interest. So what, what are they thinking about in their cyber security world right now? Uh, specifically, it depends on what their actual business itself is because you have di different regulations for HIPAA compliance, for example, which is healthcare stuff versus whether or not you're dealing with credit cards. But the most important thing is typically, are we protecting whatever our customer data is that we're currently keeping? Okay. So let's go with customer data protection. So if you created, I'm going to start with a blog post, but blog posts are not the only content. If you create a blog post, um, the 10 risks you're facing with your customer data, would your buyer want to read that? More than likely. More than like, okay, more than likely. I want you to think about the 10 things, the seven things, right? What are the things? Now, we can write a blog post, that's our typical content, right? What else is content today? White papers. So white papers are typically when we've already talked to them and they want to learn more about our product or service, and it's further down in the pipeline. But white papers typically don't attract, well, maybe in engineering they do, but t and with you too, typically in most businesses, a white paper is not the first line of content. That's not the first line of content. Um, there are seven types of content that, that prospects and clients want, and that's one of them. But typically, it's not what leads to your solution. Maybe your IT guys are looking for that. Video. I was ready for you to say this. Video is hot. Okay. Okay, this is this is probably leads down another path, so I'll make it quick. There's a difference between somebody picking up their phone and video recording themselves and putting that up on their website or their or their uh, social media. Don't ever media. do that on your website. All right. Well, you see that a lot with people who are uh, creating media for their own company or their own or their own person um, versus hiring a professional vendor to go out and do a production for them, right? So when we use the word video, there has to be a delineation. If I'm going to be in the room, when you talk about, are you doing video for your own site by holding your cell phone up and walking around the, I see a lot of realtors maybe doing that in their homes. They'll say, let's look at this home behind us. It's for sale or we're doing some renovation in this house. And there's that kind of personality versus them hiring somebody like I was talking tonight with a couple of vendors here about doing professional level productions that would look professional like television quality, right? Yeah. So when you use that word video, it's like photography. Is there a photographer in the room that would say that somebody takes a picture with their cell phone as a photographer do, right? There's, there's, so the video is so hot. So I would say how, on how your would, website. How would you define that? So I think on your website, professional video is vital. Do not put selfie video on your website. On social, I, I hope I'm okay. On social, I think, if you are looking at a house or you're out there interviewing someone, I think there is a place for real life video. I think. I don't, you may argue with that, but I would never put that on my website, ever, because that's your professional presence. But I think in today's world, a 30 second or a one minute video 
of walking around a house, of seeing a neighborhood, of interviewing the next door neighbor. Of, I, I think there's a place for that. Do you agree? So uh, I'm agreeing because it's happening, not because it might make the uh, business have a better presentation on the internet or on to the world. It's just happening. It's it's, it's organic. It's happening whether I want it to or not. Mm -hmm. And if if and if, again, if I were a photographer and I want to argue about photography, you would say it's hap that people are taking pictures of their cell phones. You know, they're not you know they're 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 actually trying to make equivalents. Like, well, why should I hire? So it's a little bit of a challenge for me, and that's mm -hmm. part of a conversation I'll have with you guys at a later well, date. One of the things, yeah. if do you go on site to do stuff? Yes. Yes. Okay. Of course. So. If you are, if you've got a high-end home, you want a high-end video. If you're doing a man on the street interview, I mean, there, there's definitely a place for both. Um, and so I 100% agree that I, and I would never put the selfie video on my WordPress site. But I would upload a one minute quick video to LinkedIn with a tip or a strategy. Be, be uh, mindful that a one minute quick video might take three days to do. So they're not, I mean, a real professional one totally minute video different. Yep. is not a trivial matter. But, Would you agree? Yeah. Yeah, but I, I just, I just as an example, I've seen a lot of people following people on LinkedIn now that are doing these uh, uh, daily, like, like point of the day mm -hmm. or subject of the day. Mm -hmm. And they, I would come across them. And they'd be sitting in front of their desk in front of their laptop, which has video and audio recording capability. Mm -hmm. And they would talk of something very important for two minutes, a motivational speech. In their in their shirt with their logo on it, and then you'd watch it and go, well, "That was a good point, right?" Mm -hmm. So I don't think there's an expectation that that's equal to a television production, right? Hundred percent agree. But in the same breath, it, it's it's achieving a goal for them, so it's happening. Whether again, like I just said, it whether I like it or not, I'm not going to get business from those clients if they feel like they're achieving the goal with their laptop instead of hiring another professional. So and I think that yeah. person can use both. But the bottom line is, video is hot right it's now. Right. In, in that in that area, it's hot. That's right. In all areas. Okay. Video video is it. People, we are watchers of video. Now, so here's my little tip. If you do video on your desktop, get it transcribed. It's not up here, but there's a, a free site called otter.ai where you upload a video and it will give you time stamped all of the otter, like the animal, O-T-T-E-R, otter.ai, and it will give you minute-by-minute minute transcript. If you pull it into like iMovie, you can throw the transcript in, and then that's, you'll see that run on the video. If you're going to do LinkedIn video, native video, which is uploading it, you want to have the transcript running. It's important. Also, if you publish that, you want to have the transcript for search engine optimization underneath the video. There's other content too. LinkedIn now has their version of stories, which is silly, but you can upload a slide share or a slide deck, a PowerPoint deck, and it, you have to manually go through the pages. But you can upload, like I can upload this to LinkedIn and people can go through. That's content as well. So you could even upload one quote of the day and it will get you visibility. So identify content that follows your buyer's journey. There's the buyer's journey. What are they searching for? So the number one piece of content that everyone misses, that is the most important piece of content when it comes to prospecting, is what is your buyer Googling before they know they need you. What is the step before you? So complex sale, you help people put together a better process to reduce the closing cycle. Before they know they need to hire someone to help them do that, what are they searching for? Can you think about it? What do you think they're searching for? Grab the mic, please. Oh, do you have an answer? Do you know what you know? I could take some guesses. Yeah, I could too. You have a mic behind you. Or take a guess. The mic is behind you. In the broad sense, it would be increasing the sales in, the, in, in general in terms mm -hmm. of kind of Absolutely. getting better revenue, things like that. Um, most people don't think of how to shorten the sales cycle because they don't think that that's possible. 
Right. They think that's a given. So it, it's always some other angle. Okay. So you might write on how do you increase sales in a 12 month period? Now, part of that is reducing your sales cycle. But what you're writing on is capturing them, right. searching for something else before they know they need. Right. Reduce, right? Does everybody get that? So think about it. Does anyone want to share what are they searching before they need you? Do you know what they're searching? I bet you I could guess. Refinancing mortgage, maybe? How long before I'm evicted? Maybe it's on, you know, how long can I how how long can I stay in my house without paying a mortgage? Might be something that they're searching for. If that's the case and you've identified that, you need to say, you would never think I'm going to write content on that, but that's who we want to talk to. So we want to write content around what is my buyer searching for before they know they need me? Because you want to capture them before they start shopping you. Does that make sense? And that leads to your solution. You're not leading with your solution. You're leading them to your solution. And if 67% of their buyer's journey is happening online before they need you, your content is coming up. Now, if you are a realtor or you're local, put areas like regions in your content, in the Philadelphia area, in Cherry Hill, in whatever that is, because you're much more likely to come up in SEO if you're in their area. So Bryn, question for you. Uh, you've talked a lot about creating content. Where are you putting the content mm. and how is it that people are finding that content? So I believe first point of content is always gonna be your blog on your website. It's gotta go there first because you want Google to index your site before it goes anywhere else. I believe, and I'm not an SEO expert, you have, in 72 hours, you're free to put it anywhere else. Google will have indexed it. Is that accurate, 72 hours? I don't know the, Does any, I don't know the time. So if you put up a blog post, Google will index it, it as content. And the first place that it's indexed will get credit for that content. If we now take that blog and now we post it on LinkedIn, LinkedIn sees it as a duplicate, but your website is getting the juice because it was first. Yeah. Is so, that accurate? Actually, you are correct. That the first place Google encounters the content, it will index it as the source. That's okay. what I meant to say. However, the 72 hour element, Google runs on their own algorithm and they could come to your site daily, monthly or quarterly based on some algorithmic attributes mm. that they've determined about your site. So the 72 hour thing is- That was a HubSpot like, thing that I learned. Yeah. Yes, he suggested that uh, you can update your site map. Submit a new site map. Submit a new site map, which Google will index. The Each way time you have a new blog? Because it then will understand Fabulous. I don't know how to do that, but I'm going to learn. Right. However, all of these things, in order for it to rank high enough on a Google search, is probably an SEO, uh, requires a good SEO job. Yes, you might end up in a Google index, but it might be on page 37, which of course is useless. So I appreciate all this content you're talking about, but in order for it to be found, on page one or page two, that's a whole other Well, so you skill asked set. me where to put it first. Yep. Now we're gonna share it. It's not just doing that. So now we're gonna take that link and share it on LinkedIn, share it in your welcome messages, get some, and, and I believe the more people that are visiting that, the higher link, I mean, the higher Google's gonna say it's relevant. That's what I understand. I'm not an SEO person. So you're pushing the content You're pushing out to your the con content to your once contacts. it's published. Okay. Right, and I do that over, so I then take buffer, I recycle my content. So if I have 25 blog posts, they are all getting shared every month at a different time. So I am recycling blog posts from two years ago as a share on LinkedIn that drives more traffic. So once a month, 
once every other month I'm sharing an older blog post and sometimes I'll say I haven't looked at this blog post in a couple of weeks and it's for this thought for me da, 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 and I'm driving it back so I recycle a lot which has been huge for me um, in that regard but it's about I put them in welcome messages every welcome message I have goes to a page on my website that links to blo lots of different things. When you connect with me, I'll, I'll send that to you. Tom, did you? I was, oh. gonna, I was gonna say, if you really want to get it indexed quickly, put it onto your Google business page. Because the Google business page is their, is their puppy, and they index that much more frequently Fabulous. than websites. Good point. So, so you, you take the link from your website and post it to your Google Put page. it on your Google business page, because they love their own puppy. Brilliant. All right, that's great. Yes. So a couple things. Uh, I was talking to somebody recently who was an SEO specialist, and I I don't know if this is when it's when you're launching your website or what we're talking about blog posts. When you first put it out, you don't want it perfect. You want it to make some changes. Then you go out and you make some changes, and then you go out again and make some changes again to get it perfect. He said it's a three-cycle thing. Um, yeah, yeah, okay. So um, now is a perfect segue for me to mention that for our February third Monday of the month meeting, we have Bucks County, Chester County, and Delaware County website specialists coming to talk about SEO, SEO Carrie Baskin, and, and Tom's going to do his thing, and then I have somebody else coming from Delaware County. So if you want to learn a little bit more about WordPress and websites, come next month. Perfect. Thank, that's, thank you, Lynn. Thank you. That's great. So if you are putting out your own content, this is the most important site for you to have. Has anyone done Grammarly.com? So I just paid, I just paid $140 for the year, but I've been using it for five years for free. You take your document, you upload it, it will tell you where your commas are, should be or shouldn't be. I can't tell you how many times I, I put a hyphen in where a hyphen doesn't belong. Or I put, you know, I put two words together and it recommends a hyphen. Or I put T-H-A-N instead of T-H-E-N. It will catch that for me. So if you are publishing your own content, make sure you're using Grammarly. Do you use Grammarly? No, but I was actually thinking, mine tend to be, mine tend to be pretty, uh, uh, pretty solid on the grammar front, but I definitely know some people I'm going to send it to. <laughs> yeah. And for, like, I, if you, you have website content that you're doing, I mean, it's amazing what we, when we write it, what we think we put and we didn't, like we read it like we put it and it's not there. This will catch all of it. And who uses this? Okay, not a lot of you. I love this, and it's free. I mean, I just paid because I tend to write in passive voice. Apparently, Grammarly keeps telling me that I write in passive voice, and I want to be assertive. So now, they're going to help me do that. Quick question: Do you know the difference between the paid and the free of Grammarly? Yeah. Well, one of them is so it'll show you the. Red, which is all the free, those are the commas, the dashes, the uh, spelling. Then there's like real deep grammar, like passive voice to active voice, and that's in yellow. So it's not grammatically incorrect, but it's not powerful. So I want to be powerful in my writing, so that's why I paid. I also do other people's stuff, so I, yeah, I want to do that. Um, what all does Grammarly cover? Does it just cover posts or does it cover... Anything. You copy your content and you paste it. So if you, wherever you write it, you just copy it and paste it and it's not actually reading the post or the document. Mm. It's the content before you post it. Oh, okay. I think it also becomes part of uh, Gmail automatically. Automatic, yes. Yeah. And, and LinkedIn. If you go to post, there's a little <clears throat> green button that'll turn red. If you have the Chrome extension, absolutely. It's amazing, right? Are you like, oh my gosh, these are amazing? No, I, I need it. Me too. My mother was an English teacher, and so I think I speak well, but she missed on my writing. So, for Lent, we talked about Feedly. Oh, Google, Google Alerts. 
everyone needs to go, you go google.com slash alerts. You need to put your name in there. You need to put the names of anyone you're prospecting or any companies that you're working with or anything you want to get alerted if it's mentioned. So, for example, I, had a, I was following one major prospect and I actually got a press release that they merged with another company. So I would have missed that, except that I had a Google alert and I was able to reach out and congratulate them and see who I knew at the company that they, it wasn't a merger, it was an acquisition, who they acquired. And I said, here's, how, here's some advice on how to update your profile so that the new people love you, <laughs> they see all, right? And then I ended up building relationships on both sides around conversation of this new acquisition. Uh, it was a bank. Um, I mean, and so I ultimately got a training class out of that because they needed to. And so now hopefully I'll have both banks. But yeah. Excuse my ignorance, but what's the difference between this and like the Google Calendar? So Google Alerts is searching Google news and Google content all day long, and it will deliver to you anything public that relates to whatever content you asked it to send you. So I put my name out there. If I'm mentioned in the news, um, you know, I get a heads up that I might be arrested, right? That's coming now. But I mean, I get alerted, like, like, for example, I got a, when this meetup went out, I got a Google alert that said my name was mentioned. And so if I had anything negative, I have a heads up on that. I decided this was a positive one, so I let that law. Yeah. As a company, if you're doing any PR, a lot of times you don't know news media that's picking it up. It'll give you an alert if it's mentioned either mm -hmm. in an article or other media. Yeah, and it picks up meetups and other things like that, too. So it's pretty cool. We talked about buffer and scheduling. You need a playbook. You need a playbook. Could you imagine, and I'm so sad that we're not in anymore, but, and my, whatever, Rams and friggin' Patriots again, but um, imagine if Tom Brady went out there without a playbook, no matter how good that arm is, they need a playbook. I like telling this with the Eagles story much better. But you need a playbook. You can't just show up to the game, even if you know all the rules of the game. You can't show up without a playbook. So what is your playbook? Otherwise, you're a random acts. You need to know your daily and weekly activities. What are you going to do? Define them. So what are things? I'm going to share five articles with Snipply, bringing them back to my calendar every single week. That's one activity. What's another activity? I am going to identify five mortgage brokers that I want to have a conversation with and reach out to them or get a warm introduction from someone. And we're not going into that too much, but if you have questions, schedule 15 minutes with me. I'll teach you some of that. But what is the activity that you are planning to do every single week? And I have a list of 10 things that we do. I don't know if I have it here. If not, I'll get that to you if you want it. Just let me know. But there's, a, there's activity that we want to do on a consistent basis that will continue to drive leads. You've got to build that out. You've got to align your LinkedIn messages with phone scripts. How many of you are on the phone talking with people? So what, when, you get on, when you make a phone call, what's the purpose of your call? is and where I'm trying to go with it. Um, but I'm on the phone a lot, so I don't are have you schedule it. calls or are you just reaching out cold? Both. Okay. But I have I have scripts, but they're more in my head as opposed to written down because they're more like an outline depending on how the conversation is going. Okay. So I call it a script. It could be an outline if you know your business really, really well. But here's the thing. When you're on LinkedIn and we're asking for phone calls, 95% of the time, if we're social selling right, and I'll do another class on this if we want to do this, but if you're social selling right, you're getting warm introductions from shared connections, and you're offering to provide insights. So you find out that someone knows the banker that you want to meet. 
and you say, hey, jo hey George, can you make an introduction for me to, to Anne? And George says, sure, or can I name drop you? Sure. Now I get on a call with Anne, or I reach out to Anne and say, I'd love to get on a call. I don't know if you're working with anyone to help relieve some of the bad loans that you've got right now, or the properties, whatever you might say. I have some ideas for you. Even if we don't work together, it could probably have a big impact on knowing when to sell off, the best time to sell off your loans. I don't know, whatever that might be. So now when you get on the phone, what's your job? To offer insights, it's not to sell them. 74% of buyers choose this rep based on who gives insights. So our first phone call, most of the time, unless they raise their hand and say, I, I'm interested in talking about your solution, has to be around insights. And then your close is, and I'm telling you this works every single time after you've offered great insights. I'd love to share with you a story of how we helped another banker do this. And they go, okay. And now we move into sort of a case study that gets them to say, I want that. You're not pitching, but now you're sharing what you've done for someone else. As a sales uh, expert, what do you think of that methodology? Oh, absolutely, yeah, you're providing value. It's providing value and they start to see that, right? And so that's the way you run calls. And when we work with LinkedIn into phone, you've got to make sure that your LinkedIn messaging aligns directly with your phone messaging. You want to develop a scalable, repeatable cadence, a, a checklist of the 10 things you do every day. So you can go in and do that. We talked about Calendly and Auto Text Expander. This was the one for mobile. Oh, here is the steps for Android. I have email yourself the templates, so you'll get this. Um, it go to language and inputs, Google key, board, text correction. It's really long for Android. iPhone is settings, general keyboard, text replacement. Connect with me, I'll send you this. Or you can take a picture now if you want. Um, is this available on like MacBook Pro and stuff like that? Because what I find like, I don't know if it's an mm -hmm. app, but yeah. Yeah. It, it's it's Chrome, so okay, Chrome. it's only about Chrome, so you can have Chrome anywhere okay, right. for this. Okay, yes, I know. I, I'm I'm Mac. Oop. Yeah. Oh, if you guys want to take that picture, how to do that? Yeah. Is your uh, playbook uh, a separate from your plan? Use, use the mic, please, oh, Gary. Um, is your playbook separate? from your planner and or your diary? Yes, intended but I, I take my playbook and I actually schedule activities in my calendar. So my playbook is, the, you know, what I, all the activities, all my scripts, all the things I need to do. And then I go into my calendar and I have, you know, 30 minutes scheduled at different times in the week to do different things. So Sunday I um, curate and, uh, schedule all my content shares. Now I still share during the week if something pops up, but that runs on its own with Snipply. There's no special app that you're using here. You're just taking you, so your use thoughts Feedly. or notes or whatever and sticking them into your calendar? No, well, I mean, I create playbooks for people. So that's like a major piece of what I do. So I have a process around that, which I'm happy to show you, but I'm not prepared to go through that now. But if you want to schedule 15 minutes, I can show you how I do that. It's definitely visual, and I, I don't even have my own computer hooked up here, so. Any other questions? So we did that, find that email. Value-centric profile, we talked about really developing, growing your credibility on your profile. Training, we're at the end. Now here's the other thing is, no matter what you do, you've got to, make sure that you are measuring for improvement. So you have to set your KPIs. What is my measurement of success? Is it that I have 10 new phone calls a month based on my connections, which is a results goal? And then what is the activity goal to get me those phone calls? And at the end of the month, we look at that and say, did I get my 10 new calls? And the answer is no. We have to change the activity. So. We do uh, 
you know, what's, what's working and what's not working, and then stop, start, and continue. Have you ever done that? So I do this weekly with my team. It's a lot. Monthly is fine. And you want to, what are we going to stop doing? Because it's not working. What are we going to start doing, which is something maybe we decide, like today, we had our meeting this morning, we do every Monday morning, and we decided we're going to do guest webinars because we're like out of content ideas. Now, so you know, we're going to move from our own content to bringing guests on. So if anyone knows anyone in the sales space that wants to be a guest, let me know. We'd love to have you. That's something we decide to start doing. We haven't done that yet. We're going to put KPIs around that. And then we want to, and what are we going to continue doing or increase doing? So you want you definitely want to measure. Oh, start, stop, and continue. I'll, I'll volunteer for you. I'll do your sales stuff. You want to do it? Sure. All right, we'll do a webinar. Awesome. What are we gonna do it on though? It's got to. I, I'm. Well, you have to tell me what you what 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 will my audience care about <clears throat> that you do. Uh, specifically because I do cybersecurity for a living, and I guarantee that most of your people probably, unless they have some sort of security background, don't have that much basic knowledge on things that are staring them directly in the face that they have no idea on. If yeah, you're so looking what, for sales stuff in particular, though. How to sell into the IT world would be a great one. Perfect. Like, how does, how does, right, so that would be, that would be more, my people want to know how to sell. They don't care about their cybersecurity. They're, it, it's the except wrong for department. that's what the people that they'll be talking to care about. Right. Okay. But that, that's, so that's perfect, right? But so how to have the right conversations, how to sell into IT, let's do it. Perfect. So we'll schedule something. Great, Cody. I'm looking forward to that. Oh, so that's the end. So what do you think? What did you think? Was this good? Was it well, time well spent today? Oh, yay. How are we on time? It's 8.20. Uh, we could probably, if you, I'll, we I'll have take time questions. for, for, for Q&A. Yeah. You just grab the mic, please. So in point number eight with the uh, coaching, is this where you would also assess effectiveness of the execution? Absolutely. Because it's, it's not just, so you don't want to move on from something unless you have effectively executed a right to test. So I, took, I made this, I simplified this for this room, but when we work with sales teams, we really measure the KPIs and the results, and we don't stop something like that. I mean, there's like that. We don't stop something just for the sake of stopping it. Here, I'm gonna go put my contact information back up so we can see that. So yeah, I mean, this was a very simplified. So I have a question here. Uh, one of the things that I'm beginning to learn as I get older is that different age groups behave differently on social media. Mm -hmm. uh, what you've talked about tonight appears to be one size fits all, but we both know that's not true. Everything is customized. Right? So give us some insight into how you would change your proposal, your plans for the 20 to 30 year olds, 30 to 40 year olds, 40 to 50 year olds and older. Well, so it's a little more than I can I'll go kind of big picture. Big I'm, picture. Yeah. So when we're, if, if you are my client, I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on navigating social. You got that down probably better than I do. But what you might need help with is um, how to pull content out where someone who's more seasoned is not going to know how to navigate, but they're full of content because they've lived more and experienced more. So I would handle, we would spend way less time on navigation and way more time on sales strategy and content. And if I worked with these guys, we're gonna work on tactical, tactically, how are we gonna get through this? And I'll, because we're, if I said to them, go search for this, they see it once, that we need step by step, we gotta go back, how did she find that? It's just a different, like, it's just different, right? But if I said to you, you know, come up with the um, five risks of new product launch, you'd be like that. We could pull that out and we'd have a blog in 20 minutes. With you guys, 
it would probably take us an hour and a half to do a blog because you're newer at this and we're pulling, I, it's like you'd have to think deeper, you don't have as many stories to go back to. But as soon as I said, okay, go publish it, I don't have, I give you the steps once, you're done because your brain will work that way. So that's a little of the, I mean, I fall here except for LinkedIn. LinkedIn I've got down, but like with my CRM, I literally have to go back five times to find out where do I find the marketing tab drop down. Like where, you know, because my brain isn't, wasn't built on iPads, <laughs> right? Like these guys. I'm assuming you're young. <laughs> or really good skin, either way, you know, right? But, but, you know, this is my 50th year. I turned 50 this year. And so I'm on the other side of technology. Even though I got this LinkedIn thing down, I understand I grew up as a sales trainer. It's all downhill here, right? All downhill from here. So that's where I, so it's not necessarily, it's where we spend time is the first, I assess the need and then that's where we dive into time. But every single client has a different plan. We start with these topics and we drill down to what the need is, what their goals are, what are their KPIs, and then develop it. So it's really hard to answer that on a overarching question. Any other questions? Even specific. So earlier tonight, you said that the slide deck will not be available through the consortium. If well, somebody PDF wants to get a copy of it, how would they get it? You have to connect with me on LinkedIn and ask for it. Okay. I'm going to PDF it, and I'll get you the PDF. Does everybody understand? So the videos will be available. We'll mm -hmm. post that. But if you want a copy of the slide deck, you need to reach out to Bryn on her LinkedIn, which is up on the screen there. Yeah, I'm the only Bryn Tillman on LinkedIn so far. Use the microphone, please. Uh, I have a t-shirt is... that says, use the microphone. I should wear that the next time. <laughs> we'll memorize it the next time. Um, silly question. I, when I worked in industry, probably in 2005, I started a LinkedIn account. But then I thought, gee, I'm going to be here at my company till I retired, which was the case, so why bother? So now I have an ad email address with my former employer, which I no longer have. Can't remember what my user ID or password mm -hmm. was. How do I get into LinkedIn and cancel yeah. it? Yeah, so there's a couple of things. One, you need to, when you are um, logged into someone else, look you up and grab your URL. Okay. So you can, right, so when you're logged into someone else. Then you can go to, then log out of that person, you can go to help.linkedin.com and put in a request that says you forgot your password. I don't know if you have a Twitter account, but, yeah. or find someone that does because their Twitter customer service is about 700 times better than their regular help. So it's at LinkedIn help is their Twitter address. I get things immediately resolved when I go to at LinkedIn help, but if I go through LinkedIn help site, it could take me weeks. Um, and so you just explain the situation. Sometimes they'll ask you for your driver's license number to prove that it's you, which is a little weird, but it's they're what they do. You want to put that on Twitter? Not your driver's license number. Oh, okay. What, yeah, you don't want, and your social security number and bank accounts. No, but on the back end through email. Put, you can put your email, please contact me via email. But if you contact them on Twitter, you get response. I think I found you on LinkedIn. You have two connections. You're better off just starting over. Oh, <laughs> I agree. And then once you have a new account through LinkedIn, you, through LinkedIn, you can grab that old URL and say, please delete this account. I, I should have asked that question first. Is it worth saving? Good job, Lynn. Yes. Use the microphone, please. You know I'm going to ask that question, right? My error. Sorry. What's the tactful way to start a conversation when somebody schedules a, um, a phone conversation with you? Mm -hmm. And they might schedule in a half hour or something like that. But in the midst of the conversation, 
you're coming to realize that you have not only another appointment after that conversation, right, another schedule, or you think this is going to go too long. Okay, I mean, so I schedule 15 minute calls and I have a 15 minute buffer. So if it go, if I want it to go longer, that's why that time trade didn't work for me and Calendly did because I could put a buffer in. So I set expectations pretty early on. I was a sales trainer, so this is what we did. And my call might go something like this. So I'm gonna, we're gonna get on a call. I've set up this call. I've engaged with O on LinkedIn. I said, you know, I'd love to share some insights around how LinkedIn can help you grow your um, investment business. Let's hop on a call. And I was like, okay, I could use some tips. So he schedules a call. So, oh, thanks so much for jumping on the call with me today. I'm really excited to share some insights on how you can grow your real estate investment business. But before I go into my thing, and by the way, I did some rapport building before that. But before I jump into my thing, is there something specific you were hoping we were gonna cover? So sometimes you'll say, yeah, actually. And sometimes, and then I would follow that path if there's a reason that he wants to talk with me because that's a buying signal in my mind. And if he goes, you know what, I'm just curious, you had a great profile, you mentioned you were gonna provide some insights, I really didn't have any expectations, fine, great. You know, here's what we're gonna, what I can share. I can share some ways for you to get your profile to attract your targeted buyers, and some ideas on how you can leverage your existing network to get more introductions to your, um, your targeted buyers. But before I do that, can I ask you a couple questions so that when I give you these insights, they're really relevant to you? That gives me an opportunity to ask a few discovery questions without it feeling like I'm jumping down his throat. So who's your buyer, right? We'd have that conversation. Brokers, what's their challenge? So I'm finding discovery questions, but those questions will lead to real insights that I can provide. So you're doing video, right? So who are you reaching out to? Use the microphone. Small businesses in the, uh, in the uh, Willow Grove area. Okay. So, and what, is, what, is, what are the insights that you can offer them without buying from you? What are things that, you know, value that you could provide even if they never buy from you? Well, I could explain what the process is in getting their material aired on television. That's a pitch. Tell me value that they could use even if they don't buy from you. So, so Google knows that people stay on websites longer when there's a video. And they track your site visit and the amount of time that you stay on a site. And they know that sites with videos are more popular, thus those sites get higher rankings. And when you think about it, with a phone, you're one-to-one -one with your phone. If you have a play button on your phone, that video will be absolutely watched because that phone is your own personal boob tube and you're gonna watch that video. That's an amazing insight. That's, they don't have to buy from you yet, but you're leading them closer to your solution, which is video, by giving them valuable insight. Features and benefits, right? Well, it's not. It's tips and strategies and tactics that lead. It's like breadcrumbs, right? That lead to your solution. Your solution is video. He's not selling you video. What he did was talk about how video can impact your business in a way that gives them an insight they didn't have before and it's close, leading closer to your solution. So you had one too? I was specifically thinking, let's say that you're targeting businesses who have a product to sell. Just take a case study that says a business demonstration of the use of the product, which you're only going to be able to do more or less through a video, sells a product this percentage higher than any other point. Perfect. So that, that's perfect. Both of those. Ideal. So I'm going to ask some discovery about do you have product launches. And, and hopefully I've done my homework before the call too. I've looked at their website, I see what they have, I see what they don't have, right? There's, a, there, you know, for every 15 minute call, there's 20 minutes of research, right? 
And so we have to make sure that we're coming prepared, that we recognize that you put that website through whatever, you know, and it, get a free or cheap analytic tool that tells them how long people are staying on, tells you their Google Analytics. Can you do that? Okay. And so you go, you know, your average bounce rate is like 90% and it's this and this, this. Video can make a big difference. Yeah. Uh, microphone. Use the microphone. Thank you, Bryn. <laughs> you got a job, Bryn. <laughs> so, um, someone, someone said something earlier, we don't know what we don't know. And so I use it as an opportunity to uh, teach someone, typically a new real estate investor, someone who's fairly young, um, you know, something that they're not, they're probably not going to know. And uh, one of the first things that, uh, that I usually bring up in conversation is, is, do you have a dictionary of legal and real estate terms? No one's ever said yes to me. And yet, real estate is very much legal and certain terms that are strictly for real estate. So, so where do you buy one of those? At any bookstore. <laughs> well, yeah. Pardon me? I know somebody So my daughter oh, is, well, tonight is her first real estate. You know what? Class. The app, the app is the app is fine, but in the particular case if you have to be sitting in front of someone who you want to buy the house and the term is you, you use the term and they don't understand it, you can hand them the dictionary. You can look it up in the dictionary and actually hand it to them. Or text it. To them. <laughs> well, you, you, you could text it, okay? Yeah. No, but I get your point, and your point is that you are providing a great piece of value by letting these new brokers know something they didn't know about before. What he just said, what Tom just said about Google is something that we didn't know. And that's what you want to do. You want to help people something yes. they don't know. Ideally, it sort of comes off as creative. Yes. You know, I agree. what a creative idea, you know. But that's how we should, in this era, especially in selling to these younger people, they're much more savvy than, than my generation. We buy into the QVC stuff way faster than they do. They can see through all the show, I think, right? Like, could you. you you can roll your eyes and go, oh, my God, this is a pitch, much faster than we're going to pick up on that. Can I ask Gary a question? If you yeah. Don't mind? Uh, so, Gary, uh, if you're in front of a, a seller, a distressed property seller, and they have a question about a term, real estate term, you're going to hand them a dictionary? Aren't you going no, to no, explain no. it to them? No, I am going to explain it to them. Okay. Yeah, absolutely. You got me but, scared But I pull, I pull the dictionary out, and... And it adds credibility to, to what throw you're at them or well, no, no, it? it adds credibility to what you're saying. It does absolutely. When Can't you, you can explain it to them? Doesn't well, it you can credible? explain it to them, but you know, some people understand it well, and they think, oh yeah, and that's great. But a lot of people have a hard time with it, and so when you pull out something like a dictionary that shows it in black, what you're saying is in black and white, it adds credibility to what you're doing and saying, and and it's also just a tool because some people just like. We all learn differently. Some people have to see it in front of them. And I think the other thing, so if that's, if, but you're, if you're talking about new brokers that are young, you may, oh, it, no, it's but if you're talking to a new broker, you may want to say, hey, there's an app, because they're going to be much more excited to download the app than to have a physical book that they have to carry around. So you have to know your buyer, right? You have to know who's sitting in front of you. Yes. This is all very interesting to me. I'm learning a lot just by listening. Me being younger, I want to be diverse to be able to help older people as well as younger people. And what I find a lot of the times is that being younger, sometimes you're not taken as serious, which is understandable. Mm -hmm. So I kind of want to bridge that gap that we have mm -hmm. of, you know, the older and the younger. And I think Cody said something about having a podcast about how millennials think. I would really be interested because I think we need to have that crucial conversation mm -hmm. so that we all can work better together. And that would be something that I would like for you to do as a podcast, as a guest, is to talk about um, the younger generation and how, you know, we we may not know everything, but we do add value. And I want the younger people to understand that the older people, too, have value as mm -hmm. well, that we all can, like, 
co-mingle together and make something new. So I would really so, be interested. You'll be the first listener to the podcast. <laughs> yes. I, yeah. So I, this is not my realm of expertise, but I, what from personal experience, the more you ask them and you want to learn about them, the more credibility you have. Right. Right? So you, your earning of credibility is being an amazing listener and being excited about who they are as human beings. That in and of itself, like, have you ever heard the saying, you know, if you talk 10% and they talk 90%, they say what a good conversation they just had, right? right? Like your job with an older person, if you're in their house, is ask questions about the pictures on the wall, right? right? And, and spend very little time talking about their foreclosure that's coming up right. and really just get to know them. And the more you get to know them, the more they will love you. Right. Does everybody agree with that when you're talking? And that's all you need for credibility. And I'm going to tell you something that you're going to hate, but how old are you, 25? 30, oh, you're not that young. <laughs> you really look like a baby. <laughs> Okay, you're like borderline adult. <laughs> no, I'm kidding, no. <laughs> I'm, yeah, no, no, no. I have a 30 year old, so like I'm looking at 31 going, okay, no, I'm kidding. So you're amazing, that's amazing. So 31, to someone who's 90, there's very little difference between 31 and 45 in their eyes. People that are in their 80s and 90s think I'm young. Right? So your credibility in an older person has less to do with your age than you think. It, it's a story you're telling yourself. We all tell the stories. I'm not saying it's a story that you're telling yourself. And quite honestly, 31, you're out of that, I'm too young. You have experience. Right? You do. It's called self-limiting belief. Yeah. Which is about a five-year course. <laughs> to get yeah. over it, yeah. But but he, here's here's an exercise that I do. So I do everything on my bathroom mirror because everything, not everything. All of my belief system things are in posty notes, and my planning is on my bathroom mirror. But if you put on, I want you to do this for the next month. I want you to do thirty of these or thirty one of these every day. Put up there the value you bring to a client. And I, at the end of the month, I want you to have 30 post-it notes on your bathroom mirror. Different. What's a, one value I bring to a client? So I'm going to tell you a story. This is a value story. This is about selling story. It's about not offering sort of a story and being afraid to sell story. Because are what, do what you do bring value? You could just nod. It's okay. What you do, does that bring value to that homeowner? Okay. If you don't do what you do, are you doing a disservice to that homeowner? Right? So if you don't help them get out of that home, they lose it completely. What you do helps them get some money, maybe, potentially, that they're not totally destitute? OK. So do you think that brings value to them? OK. If you don't offer that service to them, did you do a disservice? to them. Did you, is, so you have a, a fiduciary responsibility, you have a responsibility to let them know that there is an option that doesn't totally destroy them. You have, a, you have an obligation to help these people as much as you possibly can. If you don't offer it to them and no one offers it to them, they're stuck. You have, you've given them maybe a little cushion or a little something that could make a difference. Okay, so think about, or if it's the mortgage company, you might save his job, right? Like think about, so these are the things, think about the value you bring. Quick story, first time mom, I have a three-year-old I want to take to Disney World. I went every year as a kid and I can't wait to take my child. I was a young mom, and I called my mom, and I said, what do I do? She goes, I don't know, call a travel agent. That's what we did. Okay. So I called a travel agent, and I am now a 23-year-old mom walking in with my 3-year-old daughter, single mom, and I sit down, and I say, I want to take my daughter to Disney World. 
She asks me no questions. She puts me in the Dutch Inn. I used to stay in the Polynesian on the monorail, and you're putting me in the Dutch Inn. Has anyone say the Dutch Inn? I don't want to say the Dutch Inn. That's 10 miles from the park, because she thought she was going to save me money. She didn't ask the questions that I needed to be asked in order to sell me the right thing. So if we have, so she had self-limiting beliefs that I wasn't going, I had like $5,000 for two people to go on this trip. She could have made a lot of money on me. I never went back to her either. So my point, when you have these self-limiting beliefs like she does, it affects your buyer. It affects your stakeholder in a way that's not serving them best. So if you can come to the table with all, not like what you do well, but how you help, the difference that you make for people, you're going to blow your sales away. Because you're providing a real service to them that they'd be less than if they didn't have. Can I add, add something, if you don't mind? Yeah. So, Bryn and I have had many <laughs> hours of discussion on this topic. Most of what Bryn has talked about tonight is what I would call prospecting, mm -hmm. is getting somebody in front of you or in your ear. What, she was, what Bryn was just now talking about is what I call the sales process or, or, or the actual sale. That's an entirely different yes. topic which takes, we've had, we've had workshops on that. I've spent 30 years training in that. Mm -hmm. These two gentlemen, I'm sure, have spent an equal or greater amount of time training on that. You don't have to spend 30 years to get successful, but it's an entirely different uh, t topic area. If you'd like, afterwards, we can talk a little bit about it. But Sorry, most, I went on my tangent. That's okay. Most of what you heard here tonight is to get somebody to contact you. Once they're once they're in front of you, then begins the sales process. And I'm going to show my age now. Uh, I would say most people who are trying to sell have virtually no skills at selling. And as a result, they don't get the results they want. And that's very sad. And usually when they don't get the results they want, they'll say something like, there are no good deals out there. Well, there's plenty of good deals out there. You just don't know how to close the sale. That's a whole other conversation for another night, but uh, sales training is the topic you need to address. If that's, totally. are, are you doing a prospecting or are you doing closing? I know you're, I know, you know, Tim and Elaine and all that. So what's your job? Grab the mic. Take the mic, please. Actually, um, I just got my realtor's license in Delaware, so I'm really a newbie. Um, I've had, I have experience through the family, so I've, seen them do some deals and things, but... Are you going to be selling retail real estate or are you going to be closing deals? Um, are you closing, uh, buying distressed opening. properties? Well, both. Well, both. Okay. All right. So. Another conversation. Yes. <laughs> right. Sorry, Bryn. No, I think this is all really important. Um, but when it does come to prospecting and you have that first call, you've got to believe that what you are bringing to the table will make their life better. So there are th three pieces. Number one, you have to love what you do. Number two, you have to be really good at what you do. And number three, someone has to be willing to pay you for it. And if you can get those three things, you're gonna have a nice little career or a big career. But you've gotta do those three things. And if you can make an impact and believe it that you're showing up and that if I do not sell my service to these people, they are, they are going to be less successful or less. Like, I have an obligation to show them the impact that I can have. So I'll leave it at that. Connect with me on LinkedIn. Happy to send you lots of resources. This was a lot of fun, guys. I hope you enjoyed this. Let's give Brent a round of applause, please. Thank you very much, Brent.